All right, welcome to the sixth session of the Dreaming Out Loud workshop, uh, food workshop series. I'm going to wait just a couple more minutes for more participants to join us, and then we'll get started. There we go. And if you have any questions in the meantime, or you just want to chat a little bit, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. I'm just going to give it like two more minutes and then I'll get started. Uh, today's topic is about working with a manufacturer for your food business. Um, this was a, we were, I was just having a conversation about working with the food manufacturer a moment ago, and it was, um, there's a lot to know. So we're going to go over it in just a moment. Um, I'm just going to give it maybe two more minutes. All right, and I'm just gonna wait um, another minute or so. Um, today we're talking about working with a manufacturer for a food business. And this is, um, there's a lot to know here. It's a one hour and a half class. And I encourage you to ask questions as we go, uh, especially because I see that some of the businesses here are um, startups. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because um, I did get an email from one of you Today, I didn't get a chance to answer it yet, but I read it asking about working with a manufacturer. So I'm going to answer the email in this class and then also answer any questions you might have. Um, so I'm just going to give it one more minute and then we'll get started. All right, so I think I'll get started. Um, I am gonna get started right now. So we are recording. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Um, and we're just gonna talk today about working with a manufacturer for your food business. Um, and in working with a manufacturer for your food business, we spoke a little bit um, last class and I'm gonna talk about it again about hiring and training for your employees. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about that as well, as I also teach you a little bit about working with a manufacturer. And the reason I'm gonna talk about both of those subjects today is because when you are working with a manufacturer, you need to make sure that your production facility is running really smoothly and um, I was actually just talking to someone today about the advantages of opening their own manufacturing facility rather than joining a co-packer. Um, so there's a lot to explore here. Um, and again, this is going to be, um, it, it's going to be a lot of information and you're going to receive it as in a very generalized form. But I know that the businesses here um, you either have a, a baked good or a snack. And when you have these items, I'm going to try to gear my information toward these types of products. But when you have these items, you just want to make sure that your steps of service or your steps of manufacturing or your assembly line is fully ironed out before you approach a manufacturer. And we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, and that's also why you have technical assistance. So if you need help developing your system for production, um, that's what I do. That's why actually I'm a counselor with these different organizations as a chef. So I help more so in the chef aspect and I'll connect you with other counselors if you're looking for marketing and branding 
or looking for funding or some sort of licensing. But in this one, this one, I do have a lot of experience in. So schedule technical assistance time if you want to speak with someone about your production and about how you're going to do your assembly line. So today we're talking about working with a manufacturer for a food business. The reason we're talking about that today is because last time what we spoke about was hiring and training your employees. So in your business plan, as you write your business plan, you should be able to put in your financial forecast how many employees you're going to need or what's your team going to be, um, we're going to consist of, who's going to be on your team. And then you'll have an idea for what your operations will be. And once you do that, then when you approach a manufacturer, you're still going to have some sort of operations that you're going to transfer over. And you're going to need to have a clearly defined idea as to how to actually do that so you can work with the manufacturer and make it happen in a large scale. So that's why we did that class before this one. So that's why we're doing this one today is talk about as you grow and you work with a bigger place. Um, before I do that though, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the grant that is a grant opening in um, this month, in the month of October. I gave you all two links um, in the bunch of the past classes. Um, I'm going to, what happened? Hello. So my screen blinked. There we go. All right, it looks like you're still here. So I'm sorry, my screen just kind of went black there. Um, but what I'm gonna do, what I was saying is I'm gonna share with you the links. Um, this first link that I'm sharing with you is the link to um, the updates. So the grant will be open in late October and it will be posted on the Nourish website. So the Nourish website chat, and I'm gonna share it with everyone here in the chat. And if you don't see it, just let me know. Uh, but this is the first link that they wanted me to share with you. And then the next one is the Capital Impact website. So this grant, um, I've told you about this one before, but I'm gonna say it again. Um, this grant is a pool of $500,000. Um, Nourish DC and Capital One are um, sponsoring this. And this is $500,000. And I'll put the criteria on the chat as well. You can apply for up to, for between $10,000 to $50,000. And if you need help with the application, um, Nourish DC does have consultants that will help you with this. Um, and then we, I will do my best to help you. And then for this one, this is a great opportunity for businesses that have already been in business for a while. So I do see that um, a few, I think two of you here today could qualify for this. So pay attention. Uh, <laughs> so listen up. It is between $10,000 to $50,000. Um, I put the criteria in the chat. You must have a food business that grows, processes, distributes, or sells food products um, or agricultural inputs for food production. You must be physically located in DC. Preferences for businesses located in Ward 5, 7, and 8. Uh, you must be in business and generating revenue for more than six months. And you must have earned more than $10,000 of revenue in the past uh, 12 months. So I know for a fact that this is something that somebody in this room can take advantage of. So let me know if you need help. Uh, just try to do the application and I'm sure that I can connect you with the counselor that can help you if, um, it's, if there's something you have a question about. So um, that was the Nourish DC that I wanted to talk about. Um, now I'm gonna go back to the presentation. And let me know also if you have any questions about it. Um, 
but you can access Nourish DC with those links I put in the chat. Then the next one I wanted to talk about was Open Access DC. The Open Access DC is a portal that's developed by the Aspen Institute. Um, and then for Open Access DC, the coolest thing is that you can have a checklist of the different things that you need in order to run a, um, a food business in DC. So if you go to the DCSBDC website, which is this one, I'll put it in the chat as well. That's dcsbdc.org. The DCSBDC is a free program. Um, it is funded by the SBA. It's a DC Small Business Development Center. I'm actually also a counselor with the DCSBDC. So you can access free counseling and free workshops, but Open Access DC is on this website. Open Access DC is a portal that literally lists, literally, it lists all of the things that you need in order to open any type of food business. Um, I worked with them to develop this. And if you don't think that it's complete, if you think that it needs something, that you're missing something from this, let me know because we're still developing this. This is just as far as we've gotten so far. And as we, we have this open, um, we'll be incorporating more information that you need. But I only know what you need if you tell me what you need. So just please give me feedback if you use this portal. Um, and here, if you go down here, you can look at the different um, types of food businesses. So you have a restaurant cafe, a catering company, a food truck, or a private label. And you can click it and find out what you need in order to um, open your business or keep it compliant. So I think that this is awesome. Um, I love I love this portal, but obviously nothing's perfect. So if you see anything that you would add, just let me know. I appreciate the feedback. Um, and I hope you enjoy it because this is gonna help a lot of you. Today, we're gonna talk about manufacturing. So that's more private label stuff. Um, but for restaurants and cafes and catering companies and food trucks, I always encourage making sure that you have lots of different streams of income, lots of different places where you're making money and where you have sales. And diversifying your, your what you offer, it really allows you to capture more sales from your current clientele because they might be able to tap into it. You know, maybe they want to give your sauce away as um, a, a holiday gift. Or maybe they want to buy your uh, dish as a side for their family for, for Thanksgiving. I'm just saying these different things because the holidays are coming up and this is what food businesses have to think about, even if they don't necessarily um, primarily sell those items. Um, it's always good to have other forms of income, which I'm sure that you, you all can agree with that. So in these different categories, um, you'll find the different criteria that it takes to open one of these types of businesses. And there's always combinations of the different types of services in the food industry. So you can kind of um, look if you have a restaurant that's also gonna have a private label, well, you know, you can look at both of those. And that's usually how I'm able to navigate the licensing requirements for different businesses because there are so many different combinations of services and different food businesses. And another thing I want you to take a look at in this portal is your business plan portal. Um, if you don't have a business plan yet, you really need one. And I'm hoping that you're writing your business plan as we're doing these workshops. Um, but if you need help with your business plan, just let me know. We can do a review. Uh, we can look over what, what you might be missing. And if what you're using it for is for funding, then I would also recommend that you meet with um, the DCSBDC counselors that work with the SBA funding. Um, so you could make sure that your business plan has what they ask for as well. Um, but here you have different links. And the, one of my favorite ones is in writing a business plan, the guidance that this portal gives you in, in writing it. 
Um, so if you've been to my previous workshops, I've always recommended uh, liveplan.com just because it was very helpful for me as someone who, um, um, for business plans, I like to have the breakdown and the step-by-step -step exercise and outline, but you don't need to download that program or use that program. You can just use a template. And these templates that they recommend here on this portal are really, really great. So that's Open Access DC. Um, I know I've told you about it a lot before, but I needed to tell you again, because it's a, it's a great portal and hopefully you can let me know what you think about it. Um, and then I'm just gonna continue on and now we're actually gonna jump into the subject. So thanks for, for listening for all of you who have heard that before, um, but I still think it's a good reminder, even if you've heard it before. So how do you work with a manufacturer? So working with a food manufacturer, um, do you have a secret formula? So I was talking about this actually in the last class as well with you about uh, hiring and training. When you're training, you're gonna need to have um, manuals and recipe binders. And so very rarely will you really have a fully secret formula because you're the business owner and you're gonna have to delegate your recipe. Um, but when you're working with your co-packer, this is a different type of experience because you might already have your developed recipe and then you're gonna go to a co-packer and they might ask you to change it or do different alterations. And a big reason is because of the laws. Um, we have a lot of laws to comply with when it comes to the FDA and USDA regulations. And the co-packers are not looking at the food as a chef would, for example, in a restaurant, or they're, they're looking at it in a production standpoint. So because they're looking at the production standpoint of the food, they're going to recommend to you a lot of ingredients that you might not have used before or, or um, use in general, sometimes having to do with preservatives, uh, some of them adding acidity um, and other, other things and spices that they use to create different flavors. So when you work with a co-packer, make sure that you, you have two different avenues to work with a co-packer in the beginning. You might either not, if you do not have a product developed yet, they will help you develop the product and they'll do with you the research and development and product development and packaging and then get it out to market. But a lot of the time, the people who are approaching the co-packers are people who already have created their um, their product. So when they go into a co-packer, they want it to be created at the exact same quality level and with the exact same ingredients. And that's where it gets difficult. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that right now, but first I'm gonna see what the question is. So Luciana said, what is a co-packer? So a co-packer, Luciana, is um, basically, it's a facility that, or it's a company that will package, they'll produce or package or produce and package your items in very large quantities. Um, so the biggest reason why a lot of places do this is to be able to meet up with the demand whenever they go into grocery stores. So a lot of businesses ask, for example, um, they the one of the first things that they'll ask me, and actually this is the email I wanted to talk about a little bit today. Um, a lot of people will ask me, can you introduce me to a manufacturer uh, before that they develop their their product and or before they've um, or a wholesaler before they've developed their or a solidified how they're going to produce their product. Um, a co-packer, what a co-packer will do, Luciana, is it they'll make it so that you can meet the demand because it's just a way bigger facility and it's a manufacturing facility that will do it for another business. Um, you, as a business, can create your own manufacturing facility. You don't have to go to a co-packer. 
you can do it yourself. But sometimes people want to to have that be another party. So when they want to do that, then they work with a co-packer. And that's what we're going to talk about today is a manufacturer and a co-packer. Um, they're a little bit different because pack, co-packers definitely package. Manufacturers will do that. They'll prepare your food. They'll make the food. They'll package it most of the time. So when you're working with a co-packer and you go in with an already developed product, um, it's going to be interesting. And I'm, I don't want to say it's impossible, but I always say go in there with an open mind to see what they say about your product and how they can do it or manufacture it. Um, the easiest types of products to prepare in one of those facilities are definitely snacks like potato chips, popcorn, um, corn puffs, che Cheetos, cheese puffs. Um, those types of snacks, like extruded snacks, those different things, there's more facilities available for it, that type of snack in just in general in the United States. But if you have something like chocolate or cookies or um, something that has a unique texture or a way of preparing it, I always recommend find out where your competitors are manufacturing their products. Um, because a lot of the time, the company has to end up creating their own facility because of the unique textures and um, yeah, the unique textures of their products and how that's going to react with the equipment. Um, but when you develop a facility, we can determine what type of equipment we need and you can either handle that manufacturing yourself or you can go to a place that can do it for you but they need to be able to work with their current inventory of equipment or be willing to allow you to purchase an equipment that that you um that you need so i know i just said a lot um i'm going to give an example so for example um Gourmet Kitchen. Gourmet Kitchen is a company that I used to be the sh uh, a chef there. And Gourmet Kitchen is the largest hors d'oeuvre and app the appetizer hors d'oeuvre snack um, company in the United States as far as manufacturing and as far as distribution. And what that means is that they will develop their product. They will produce it in their facility, in their factory. They will freeze it in their facility. They will package it in their facility and they will deliver it to their customers nationwide. So the reason they make the products is because they have a lot of interesting dough and different things that requires a very special type of equipment or it requires um they they capitalize or their their business is on high end hors d'oeuvres so they have to create it because they need to be able to control their ingredients and the fact that they are being handmade, even if they're being done in very large batches. That's one example of someone who decided to create their own manufacturing facility and was able to get it out to market and still sell um, to these other bigger companies or bigger distributors. Um, another example of a product that would have used a co-packer though, would be maybe um, a snack company. And so a snack company might develop the snack with the co-packer because they have the funds, because they have the money to do the research and development. To do the average run of research and development with the co-packer, it starts out at about $60,000. So 
if somebody has the money to say, okay, I have this, this amount to invest and I want to create my own unique potato chip, then you go to a company that makes that and you, you're, you're able to pay for the research and development. And the reason that that is a good option is because they know what they have, they know what's in-house and they know what they can offer you. So by using what they have, you're also saving a lot of money because you're not ordering in special spices or anything that um, can really bring your cost of goods up. So just in the, and just because I want to make this very relevant for, for everyone who's participating here today, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit through your, your products. Um, so for some of you, I'm trying to be general because I know this is recorded and, and online, um, but for some of you, you have products that have a very unique way of, um, a, a very unique formula. For example, if you have the healthy snacks, you have things that require certain temperatures, you have melty things, you have, um, you know, chocolate and different, I, what I want to say is like it's melty. It's stuff that you need a certain temperature in the room to, to work with. And actually two of you have things here that require special temperatures, cold temperatures to work with. So something that I like to just throw the seed out there in the, in, in the world and, and plant the seed is that it would be pretty cool in the future to see a lot of small businesses kind of team up and open their own facility together if they have similar products, you know? Um, but that type of product is very difficult to get into a co-packer or a manufacturer because it's it's um, requires a certain temperature, but you can still find one. It's just more difficult, but it can be definitely done. And you need to look at candy type facilities or specific facilities for that. Um, and I do also want to throw out there that this year, there was a grant out there to create for small businesses to create their own facilities. Um, and I thought that that was a great thing that they were doing um, in DC this year. And so if this is ever something that interested you, there is a demand for, for workspace as you can see, because you're also a business looking for workspace. Um, but sometimes you can also tap into grants in order to do um, facilities like that. Um, so you have to work with the co-packer to develop your, your recipe a lot of the time. Um, make sure that you're working with an attorney. Make sure that you're working with someone who's able to help you protect your your information or your formulas. There's a really good movie called Joy. Uh, Joy has a Jennifer Lawrence as the actress, but the movie Joy is about a lady who um, started a mop company in New Jersey. And it was a really good movie actually, but um, she, when she went to work with a manufacturer, they, they stole her design because she didn't, she never patented it. She never, um, did anything to make it proprietary. So just make sure that when you're working with a manufacturer, someone who's gonna produce your product, that you have the right legal guidance to help you, um, just to make sure that everything is also good on your end as well, that someone can't replicate your product and put their own label on it and, and double sell or, or build that kind of thing. Um, because sometimes that has happened in, in the world. So just be careful um, and research, find out what facilities are near you and go visit them, tour them, um, see what they have, build relationships. Because when you network and you build relationships with other people in the industry, they'll remember you and it'll be great just at least to have met them. Um, or some of you actually, um, sometimes when you go to visit them, you let me know if you had a positive experience. And I always love that because we're, I'm, I'm doing a lot of technical assistance. And so any positive information that might help another small business is always something that I love to hear about. 
Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was ingredients to avoid. So when you are developing a product in a, a different, in a manufacturing facility, the main thing that manufacturers are thinking about is their equipment. So they're thinking about maintenance of their equipment, cleaning of their equipment, uh, because they really are relying on their assembly line of machines. So because it's machines, and that's what they're relying on, there are certain ingredients that just don't do well with machines in general. A lot of the time that's fresh fruits and vegetables because the pulp, uh, a lot of the time the pulp can get caught up in their gears and all these different things. And it seems kind of silly to think about, but when you're in a normal production and you're, you're making a smaller batch, you might not deal with that type of equipment. But when you're doing very large batches, you have um, very industrial type of machines that they have to maintain. So anything that they can do to avoid um, more problems, that's what they do. So fresh fruits and vegetables, I don't wanna say it's impossible because there are definitely facilities that process fruits and vegetables for juices and whatnot, um, but typically it's harder to find. Um, and this is also why the use of citric acid is so popular when creating a lot of different um, a lot of different recipes, citric acid is used a lot instead of uh, fresh fruit juices, um, unfortunately. Um, expensive or exclusive, or exclusive spices and herbs. The co-packer wants to make sure that they can keep the ingredients that they need in stock. And the reason is because the same thing that your challenge is, is gonna be as just a, a, a business owner, um, with your business as at the size it is, when you're sourcing spices and herbs, it things like um, things like that that are natural um, ingredients. You just need to make sure that you have a source that can that can fill your orders, that can produce enough of what you need, which you can typically find. I would say I always like to look for uh, fair trade. Spices, um, a, a big reason being that my my own family's from Colombia, from South America, and we have a lot of coffee that's sold way below value um, just because, and just because people can do that in the world. So I would say I like supporting fair trade, but it's obviously it's not an obligation, but fair trade just means that the farmers in different countries are being paid what they would be paid here, or at least at a fair price so that they can um, pay their bills and sustain their, their farms. But even um, if you don't buy fair trade, um, what you wanna just make sure is that you're securing a source that's gonna be able to deal with the demand that they're gonna need as far as spices and herbs and things that, and sauces and condiments that you're gonna need for your product. One example I can give you is um, for barbecue sauce. If you wanna open a barbecue sauce company, the co-packer will typically, um, certain ones, especially here in Maryland, um, they'll make your, your sauce for you. They have like giant pots where they'll combine the ingredients and cook them, cook them and then bottle them and then label them. And they even have the little sauce um, pouches, like for um, individual sauce packets. Um, but when you're developing these recipes, you want to make sure that if you add, because for example, barbecue sauce, barbecue sauce depends on your, your formula. But my formula, for example, it does take ketchup, takes malt vinegar, paprika, um, brown sugar, and all of these different things that I put into my barbecue sauce, I just need to make sure that they're able to get the quantity that they need for their um, for their production. But for example, I don't like any any brown sugar. I like Billington's brown sugar because Billington's brown sugar is 
so much better than Domino's brown sugar. So then I have to work out a deal with Billington's brown sugar to be able to buy huge bags of it like they would purchase it do for Domino's. So as long as I provide the solution to my manufacturer, it will typically work with it, but it will adjust your price and production. So I just said a lot. Um, hopefully this is helpful, but please feel free to ask questions because I know that um, this is a lot of information to give in a, in a couple of um, in a couple of minutes, or when just not a couple of minutes, it's an hour and a half, but feel free to ask questions. But for this slide, I, this, that's what I wanted to say about it. And then I just wanted to say, keep your formula simple. If you can condense your recipe into less ingredients, you will be able to manage your inventory way more effectively. Um, I, I have another life example where somebody actually did want to create a barbecue sauce and they used um, 13 ingredients in their barbecue sauce. And it was delicious barbecue sauce, but we had to cut that down because we couldn't buy 13 different ingredients. So what we did was we did recipe development and we ended up cutting it down to six ingredients that gave the same flavor in a blind taste test. They gave the same results in a, in a panel, but the way the, um, the sauce was developed and formulated was better or different, but we were able to achieve the same results with six ingredients than had been achieved with 13 ingredients. So that's not something that I would call easy uh, per se, because you have to do a lot of recipe testing and development. But if you need help to condense your recipes, please let me know. Um, because there, there are people that are really great at that, um, just from experience with food and, and in being in the food industry. So if you do need help to simplify your recipe, please let me know. But you should not have a recipe that requires so, so, so many ingredients. And sometimes you can achieve the same with less. You just have to know how to do it. Um, then that just takes food knowledge. So if you need help with that, please let me know. But the reason I say that is because it's very important to keep it simple, mostly because of your inventory. You want to make sure that you're managing inventory. Inventory is, you know, it's a very difficult thing to manage because you don't want to have too little, but you don't want to have too much. And how do you buffer if somebody puts in a big order last minute? So I know it's hard, but condensing the amount of inventory that you, you have will always be better. Um, it just always will be. Because sometimes you might have, let's say you have a whole menu and only one product requires cinnamon and it requires only a teaspoon of cinnamon. Should you even have a teaspoon of cinnamon on your on your menu if, I mean, think about how many portions of something you need to sell in order to use up your five gallon jug or your gallon jug of cinnamon. Um, and I can help you more through that. I tried to explain it in the best way I, I could. And I'll try to work through it more with you one-on-one, -on -one. but you want to make sure that in your menu mix, you're cross-utilizing ingredients and your, your ultimate goal, your ultimate goal is to make sure that the food is delicious. You have to make your customers happy. So that's like the main thing. But then the next goal is making sure that your money is not tied up in inventory um, because it will, 
I've seen places have inventory sit there for years and it's just money down the drain. So we can work on that. But for that, for, to be able to manage inventory, I will either do site visits. Um, that's part of TA as well. If you need technical assistance, as long as I know way in advance, I can do a site visit too. But with your, we can do that. Or um, you can make a list of all of the ingredients you use and determine, is this, some, is this worth it to have this much in inventory? Or can I consolidate? Uh, but keeping it simple is basically the point. Keep your recipes simple, keep them delicious, and work with your manufacturers to develop the recipes. But in order to work with a manufacturer, the first thing you need to do is identify one. So if you need help with figuring out a, a production facility, uh, just let me know. But I, I've seen a lot of... Um, a lot of businesses be able to find them on their own. Um, it's really just doing a lot of internet searches and phone calls and, and finding out if the place produces your type of product and how you can find out what criteria they require for you to be able to onboard um, or how much it even costs. So the next question is, how do I select where my manufacturing facility will be located? And this is um, actually super important. I've, I've seen people sometimes produce really far away um, because a lot of the lower prices for, um, for those types of goods and products are typically on the West Coast. So because there's so many facilities on the West Coast and in the Midwest, the East Coast where we are, um, has more competition. And because we're, we have more competition and we have arguably probably less facilities, um, a lot of people pick the West Coast. But then the problem with the West Coast or Midwest is, okay, you picked a manufacturing facility, but now you have to figure out once it gets manufactured, where's it going to go? Who's going to pick it up? Where are you going to store it? How are you going to sell it? How are you going to get it to your customers? So you have a lot of other things to figure out. And a lot of it centers around where the facility is. So where are you putting all this together? Um, Maryland has a good history of being a factory town, especially Baltimore or even um, in Pennsylvania. So we do have a good amount of um, facilities around here too. Um, so it just takes a lot of research. That's it. You just have to identify the facility. But um, I've, I've, I haven't had that much trouble finding the right place as long as I just did my due diligence and looked. And I would recommend if you are on the East Coast and your admin is on the East Coast, then try to have everything here for yourself so you're not having to travel back and forth all the time. Um, or you need a key player over there. So any decision that you make as far as a manufacturing facility, you need to think of your whole picture. So this is why in the first workshop that we did, we spoke about um, vision, your, your business vision. Your business vision needs to align with your personal vision. So if your personal vision is not to drive from place to place so much, make sure that you have in your financial forecast um, a manager of some sort, a coordinator, someone who does that for the business because it's going to need to get done. And this part is very much about connecting dots. So the first thing I think about is pick a central location. The manufacturing facility is going to, it's going to have to be near where it's going to be stored because where it's going to be stored is where you do the distribution from. So the manufacturing facility sometimes, sometimes, not always, 
will give you shelves and you can actually store at the manufacturing facility and they have warehouse managers, or you're gonna have to purchase your own warehouse um, or rent or a warehouse, but you're gonna have to, to find your own warehouse and have a warehouse manager at that point. Um, you definitely wanna think about that person. Who is your warehouse manager? The warehouse manager is a very important role because it's the person who's taking inventory of everything coming in and everything that's leaving. Um, so it's that critical control point, like we were talking before, it's that point in connections where things can go wrong. So your critical control point from working with the manufacturer to getting it to the customer, you have the first critical control point is the making of the product, right? You have to produce it, right? So you make the food, you have it. The next critical control point is where's it gonna go? Is it gonna go to a manufacturing or is it gonna go to a warehouse or am I gonna store it at this warehouse? Then the next critical control point is who does it go to? So you have a salesperson that sold it. They have to tell someone they sold it that person they told that they sold it needs to give or to get it delivered to the customer. So you have a few dots to connect between manufacturing facility, packaging, storage, admin, and taking orders and delivery. And along all of those steps, you have to make sure that you are controlling your costs and making it as efficient as possible and as clear as possible. So the main thing there is pick a central location. Um, if you do not find a manufacturer where in an area where you need to find it, keep looking. Keep looking or let me know or something because I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I am saying that sometimes it's just about digging really deep and looking. Um, and if we don't find something, then you explore different strategies. You know, maybe it might be more cost effective for you to just produce in the West Coast and get it shipped to the East Coast and storing it and de delivering it here. That might very well be an option. But if it's not, then maybe you want to create your own manufacturing facility and figure out how you're going to do that here or wherever. So there's always a thought process in that part, in the part of where the manufacturing facility is going to go. But the main thing is just to plan ahead because it's going to impact how much money you need to execute your business. Uh, when you're working with the manufacturer, or you want to create something that you can distribute to lots of grocery stores and lots of wholesalers, um, you need to have your systems in place. And even if they're not in place yet, we have the ability to create a financial forecast. We have the ability to find out what it's gonna cost in order to have enough money to do it so that we don't pull our hair out or I, I'm i the kind of hair puller, but like when, so we don't get frustrated when we get stuck along the way because we've thought about it before because we did a business plan. So that's the whole point behind a business plan. Um, so think about that. Think about what location you're gonna pick, who's managing your warehouse and how will you deliver? How will you do your deliveries? How will you do your distribution? Sometimes you can work with a distributor. So you can have a facility and just take products to a distributor. Typically a food company will work with multiple distributors because again, the same thing I said before, any food business needs to find multiple sources of income. You can't only have one client. So your one client, it's not, not just because you work with Cisco, you can only work with Cisco because if Cisco goes down, then you don't have a client anymore. So you need to go with all of the different ones and keep trying to get in into these different um, distributors catalogs. Um, and we can talk about how to get on there. I will say that I've gotten questions from client from, from people who ask me to introduce them to a distributor. I want to be like really honest and say that I I will definitely introduce you to a distributor when you're ready. 
I don't want to do a disservice to you by bringing you to them before you're ready because you need to have all, all the things in place to be able to make a good impression. And you only have a certain chance or a certain window of time to make a good impression. So when you go and approach them, you want to have something new for them to see, you want to make them excited, and you want to show that you can actually fill the orders and do it. Um, if I introduce people before, they ruin their opportunity, and then it's very hard to get another, another meeting. So that's something that I don't tend to do, but if you want to know how to sell to a distributor, that's something that we can work through. So that when you're ready, you can go and, and, and do that. And we can do the training on how to then approach distributors, which there is a way to do that. Um, but you have to be ready first. So you have to have a catalog ready, which we already spoke about before in previous classes. You have to have your sales sheets. You have to have your warehouse um, or your, your catalog where you have your wholesale pricing and how you're going to deliver whatever they order. So you have to have the steps of ordering. Um, so we'll talk about all of that one-on-one -on -one if you need to, but we also have been doing workshops talking about sales sheets and menus. So I hope that, that at least you're working on that and creating it. Um, and for distribution, you have to have a good system for distribution as far as uh, software. Different softwares are good for different types of businesses. So if you need an assessment uh, for what your cloud-based um, systems will be, just let me know or go to somebody who specializes on cloud-based systems to find out what program will work best for you, for your business, because different programs have different features. And so when you distribute, um, it depends on what you're distributing and what the um, manufacturer, what technology they're using as far as what system you're going to use. But really, it's just an order taking system where the distributor will receive the order or will receive the um, the order being the inventory. They'll receive the inventory from the manufacturer. And when they receive the sale, they need to be able to connect the product with the customer. How will the product get from the warehouse to the customer? Um, and there's all kinds of scenarios. You can have your own delivery trucks. Um, you can deliver to the distributor. They can pick up. But you just have to make sure that you develop that system before you actually get it going. Um, so if you need help with this part, again, I know it's a lot of information in an hour and a half, but it's important to think about when you write your business plan, because as you write your business plan, you really need to be researching and gathering expenses and what those will be. What will be the potential expenses? Does every business do this? No. No, actually, a lot of businesses do not um, find out how much it's going to cost them fully before they launch. Um, and that is a decision that every business owner makes for themselves. But I highly recommend it. I think that there's nothing better than to be able to dedicate some time to creating the business on paper so that you can at least see where things might go wrong and how you can solve that situation uh, before you put it in real life. And it's a real great exercise. So this part should definitely be in your business plan. If you are if you're a snack company and you want to work into expand into either um, selling at grocery stores, selling at Whole Foods, and and those types of business ventures, you need to have a growth strategy. However, that might look like. And if you need help coming up with it, that's when we can do that one-on-one -on -one to talk about what your growth strategy could be. But that's ultimately what your decision is because it's your vision. 
Next, we're going to talk about labeling and packaging. Labeling and packaging. Um, so when you work with a manufacturer, a lot of them will have their own designers and printers and stickers and all of that already in-house. So sometimes you don't need to worry as much about it because they have everything that they need and then they'll help you design it. And then the design that you choose is what they'll just continue to use. Um, sometimes you have to develop your own labels and come up with your own uh, systems for packaging. And packaging has a lot to do with the machine. So if you have snacks, for example, and you have to bag them, um, they have different types of machines for different snacks. So that's why I usually said go to, um, or I said before, find out if your competitors are using a certain facility, find out what they're using and what they're doing, um, do some research into that. A lot of the times you can find it. Um, it's, it's pretty open information a lot of the time. Um, and see what types of machines and what they use because um, the that's going to really affect your packaging. So whatever manufacturer you choose, their machines are only going to work with certain uh, types of packaging. So work with your manufacturer to figure out what they use at their facility. And if you don't like it, and you have another option for a different manufacturer, then go see what they have. Um, if you want to package everything yourself, then you have to just create a facility for, for yourself, for, for, for packaging your product. Um, one big reason I would recommend delegating or allowing the co-packer to package it for you is typically because of the um, liabilities, especially when it comes to products with the um that are vacuum packed um those different types of steps and procedures require certain licensing or certain licenses so you just want to make sure that um if you're doing that type of thing you're you're always able to maintain the step of service and, and what i mean by that is if you're gonna personally in your facility vacuum pack your everything, you need to make sure that whoever's running that machine is an expert at that. And that person's gonna be on your payroll because it's your facility. But if you delegate that out, well, that that's kind of, that's their responsibility. Um, and they have experts that do that already with a bunch of other snacks. So it could help you mitigate an expense there. So all of that just, it really labels and packaging, labeling and packaging depends on what facility you select and what containers they use. This is very important for me to say because I see a lot of businesses choose their bottles and packaging before they even go to their co-packer. So it's just kind of a waste of time, right? If you if if you already went through all the trouble to find out how much bottles and caps and labels cost, and then you go and you find out I could have just used their bottles and labels because they're the only ones they're going to use anyway. It's a sometimes a big um, shocker to a lot of businesses because they've already done all that work and they just realize, oh, I wasted so much time because it's time. It's, it's a time dedication to pick bottles and caps and labels. So when you do it, you only really want to do it once because it's going to take you weeks or so of meetings and development and all of that stuff. So if you're going to pick a package or a label and you already know you're going to work with a co-packer, just go ask them what, what they have so you can get started at least in thinking about that. And that's if you have the capital to do so. If you don't, there's nothing wrong with having a certain packaging that you use now and then working with them later. So I would say try to be open to the fact that you might have to change your packaging a little bit down the road in order to expand in the market, but maybe you don't. Maybe what you pick 
is already compatible with their machines. So that was a that was another like big mouthful of information. Um, basically, just to say the labeling and packaging, um, you're going to probably have to work with the manufacturing facility just to make sure because they have certain machines that work with certain um, types of packaging. Um, this is an expensive uh, or one of those parts that can either get really expensive or you can maintain inexpensive. Um, but for the labeling, especially, um, I always do recommend work with a branding, um, work with a branding person. Uh, sometimes we tend to think that we can come up with our own branding and I don't want to say that we can't. I'm just also saying that different people are specialists at different things. And I'm the kind of person that I enjoy branding and marketing, but I'm not the best at it. I, I mean, I know that, I mean, I, I am very great at it as far as a food business goes, but I always hire somebody to create um any concept, I hire somebody to create the logo or a real artist to, to put what I have in my mind on paper. Um, the only logo I, I've ever designed is the Food Biz Mentor logo, and that one's because it was simple and I already knew what I had in my head. But for a food concept, a food concept, the logo and the branding needs to exude the energy of or, or, or the messaging of the food, or it really needs, it's hard because you have to make people hungry as they look at the, at the packaging. And that's a, that's a science. It's not, it's not incredibly, I wouldn't say it's the easiest thing to do. Um, so that's why for so many businesses, I usually say in the beginning, you can create your own logo, but always go back and see if you want to reinvest in real brand development. Um, to develop a really great logo with all of the different things that you need, all the different types of file types, to de develop a font um, and develop a, a web, a, I guess like a, the web design style and the lettering, the investment tends to be, and I've seen it, the cheapest I've ever seen a really good one is seven, $750. And I've seen it way more expensive than that. I've seen it $4,000, $7,000. Where I usually end up putting it in my budget is about $1,500 to $2,000. And the reason I'm giving you such a price range is because these days for logos and branding, we have fiber, which is super inexpensive. And you do get some good designs from there, but I mean, you have to really find that one talented person. Or you can go to an agency that specializes in, in food, marketing, and branding and already know what your budget is going to be and get it done in a way, in a, in a more effective way from the gym. And the reason I always point out costs for stuff and dollar signs is because you're building your financial forecast. So just when you hear an expense, doesn't mean you have to spend that money right away. You actually don't want to spend that money right away. You want to make sure that you plan for it and you spend it when you can. But you need to know that you're going to have to spend it if you, if you want the business that you're envisioning, certain things you just can't get around. And so branding and marketing is one of those things where it's the image of your business. So when you're developing this, just remember that you can either go to a branding and marketing specialist that works with food businesses, develop something and take it to the co-packer or the manufacturer, or sometimes they have them in their offices. So they will do that with you for you. Um, and they're very good. Um, I was working with another co-packer not too long ago, and their um, their brand developer worked for Kellogg's, and he was great. The other one that I worked with before, um, 
their brand person worked for Coca-Cola and he was great. So you can tap into all these amazing resources that you might not have had before just by working with these, with or selecting the right partnership, the right co-packer or the right manufacturer for you. Um, so that just takes some research. And let me know also if you have any questions as I'm as I'm talking, because I know I'm I'm giving a lot of information. But with labeling and packaging for these types of goods, just make sure that you really, really <laughs> um, invest a good not a, a ton of money, but just like the make the proper investment in your branding because you're gonna produce thousands or hundreds of thousands of these things. So um, you wanna make sure that that is, is, is developed to the most effective way possible. Um, and then if you're a small business and you're not able to spend or have that budget, just know that maybe two or three months from now, you can invest that. You can put in your, in your savings or in your budget, okay, I'm gonna have to spend this much for branding and marketing, I'll spend it in January, I'll spend it in April. Uh, so give yourself the space, but I do definitely um, recommend proper brand development. Um, and then for labeling and packaging, they will work with you on what bottles, what bags, what they have available. And if you are gonna start with them, then I recommend waiting and starting the conversation with them and not shopping around for packaging for your product because you're just going to have to do it again. If you already have a business and you already buy your packaging and you already do this, just know that you're probably going to have to develop you're probably going to have to develop it again and that's okay um because that's just the next step in your journey. Um so it's okay to do it again. Then the next most important thing about working with a uh, manufacturer and a, and a co-packer and a distributor is definitely in managing your, um, your sales. Managing sales is the most important part or next to making the food because you need to make sure that whoever orders is gonna receive it. Right. And customer satisfaction is the ultimate important thing. And you need to make sure that the customer receives their order in a timely fashion, amazing food, and it was worth their money because then they'll keep coming back. If it wasn't worth their money, they're not going to keep coming back. And typically with small businesses, our price points are a little bit higher. So we really, unfortunately, unfortunately, but we have to win our customers' habitual um, purchases. And we have to really win them over with a lot of work. And mostly it's in trying to keep the product at the lowest price we can sell it for, um, if possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Um, we have to give them high quality and they have to have the perceived value or even more perceived value of the product than what they paid for it. So when you manage your sales, how will you get it to the customer? Uh, so you need to develop a sales account. So this is why I talk so much about CRMs, about customer relationship management systems. I've also seen companies use email, like regular email. I don't love that because it's very confusing for me. Um, I mean, I'm sure that you all are used to getting a bunch of emails every day. I definitely am, and I am, and and I cannot manage customer accounts via email. I need a system where I can type in the person's name, see all the conversations I had with them, see what sales they've placed, and when they were supposed to deliver it, all in one place. I don't want to click from email to email. So, in developing your systems, make sure that you're doing that for your whoever you're delegating it to for your um, for your staff, invest in a really good CRM. If you're working with a manufacturer, chances are you're already hitting a larger business level. Um, so Zoho would still work for that. Um, 
and Salesforce is for like once you're like Coca-Cola size, like that's a big one. But you, Salesforce is a great CRM as well, but it's for much larger companies. And Zoho is the other one that's for a good, a decent, um, it's still for big business. It still works for big business. And they also have it on their website to say how many accounts they support with each membership. Um, but I definitely recommend a CRM. Um, I think that it's really important, especially since as a business, if you're working with a co-packer and a manufacturer, you're going to have a sales team. You're going to have lots of salespeople because you need to sell a lot. So because you need to sell a lot, you're going to have to have a very well-developed sales strategy. So when you're developing the sales accounts, just make sure that you have a system to track the customer, the order, when they received it. Um, typically, when they receive the order, they sign a document saying they received it. Um, so you just have to make sure that you have all those steps in place. Again, this is something that in in a class on on in such a short class in an hour and a half, you're receiving more. I mean, information that it took me about twelve years to find out. There wasn't a university that taught all of these things. This is very piecemeal based on experience and speaking to people in the industry also. And so it's a lot of information, but the only reason I'm telling you the full way is so you can write your business plan because I want you to schedule technical assistance. Um, this week, some of you scheduled technical assistance and it was very difficult for me because I had the family uh, situation. But for the rest of this month, for October, November, December, January, February, I am going to be available for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. Um, so just make sure you email me because these are the months that you can definitely take advantage of the snuggly snow days and write your business plan. I love snuggly snow days and just staying in and writing your business plan and figuring out where you're going is such a healthy exercise. Um, and for your, your business plan, you definitely want to show your investors that you have a way of managing your sales accounts. So you develop your accounts and then you have to work with distributors. So working with distributors takes a certain position in your staff that's going to be the representative for those accounts. And you have to have the right systems in place for the person to work with those distributors. And there's a lot of different components to it. Um, one of them would be sampling products. How do they approach major distributors? How will they do their presentations? How will they get there? You know, Do you coordinate a vehicle? Do they have their own vehicle? So that's a whole job description that you're going to need in your financial forecast because that's a job. That's a whole employee. Um, it can be a part-time employee. It can be a commission paid or base pay. You know, you can have a certain pay and then do commission, but that's a position in your, that's a line item in your labor cost. That's a very important position. You need someone to be able to maintain those relationships. So when you're managing sales, you're figuring out your software, you're figuring out your team, your staff, um, and then in meeting order minimums. Uh, you're gonna have to meet every order minimum for your co-packer. So you need to sell at that rate or more because the co-packer can always make more, but they won't do less. So if they can make more, then you might just have a little bit of order lag time. If they make more than what you sold, you're going to lose a lot of money in inventory. So your sales have to be going at a faster pace. So how do we meet those order minimums? We're going to talk about that, especially individually in your one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. And a big reason is because I always recommend that before you sign on with a manufacturer, before 
you sign on with a manufacturer. Before you develop and, and open your own manufacturing facility, before you do any of that stuff, you have to have the sales. And then, so how do you get those sales? And that's something we can work one-on-one. -on -one. The one way was in the marketing and branding class that we spoke about um, having the, the sales sheets and the menus. That's one of the easiest ways to gather sales because you have a tool. Um, and then you have to be able to have order sheets and have people place orders. So there's a way of approaching people and we can do that training individually. But the main point to gather from this slide is that you're gonna have to meet an order minimum. If you don't meet that order minimum, you're still gonna get that order. So you're gonna have things backlogged in inventory and you don't want to have sitting inventory. So how are we gonna manage that? Um, and maintain the relationship with your manufacturer. Your manufacturer is basically becoming your, your cook, your, your, your food production team. So how do you maintain a healthy relationship with them? Um, you want to be, make sure that every time that you communicate with them, you're doing it in a positive, constructive way. And we can talk a little bit about having, you know, how, how certain things sometimes can go wrong and what mitigates that those misunderstandings. But really, it's really about documentation. Anytime you're speaking with a manufacturer, make sure that you're writing a follow-up email, make sure that everything you all say to each other is very clear because you're both dealing with a lot. You're dealing with managing all those sales, they're dealing with producing all that food. So there is a, um, a way of doing it. And that's something that we can talk further about technical assistance. But the main thing is document everything along the way. Um, I mean, and, and that goes with everything. Um, and then I can definitely give another class about um, approaching distributors. Actually, I, I would love to. So I'm going to write that down so I remember. Um, but Veronica asked, can I give another class that's about that subject? And I can definitely do that. Um, so we'll do a class on approaching distributors. We officially, from this, um, this, this webinar series, have two great classes for this incoming year. The one is in how to use Instagram um, for food businesses, so that that's pretty cool. So we'll do an Instagram focused webinar and then we'll do an, an approaching distributors focused webinar, but that's gonna be about materials and presentation. So that class will be about what materials you need and then it'll be about how to do the presentation. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. I love feedback. It's always very helpful. Um, so. Maintaining the relationship with your manufacturer, I just mean making sure everything is clear because you are business partners at that point. Um, you're, you're business partners, you're both profiting from your product. Um, and I have seen things get lost in translation, but it always is because of not following up with an email. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about the body of the email and how, how you should put it together every time you do a follow-up and how you document that so that you know where you stand with your, um, with your manufacturer. But managing sales is the most, one of the most important steps of this dot connecting for working with um, co-packers. So I just wanna go over all of this again, just real quick. So we talked about the recipe development. We talked about where to select your manufacturing facility. We talked about how to pick how you're gonna label and package your, your item. We talked about how you're gonna sell it and how you're gonna get it to the customer. Um, next, I'm gonna review things that we talked about in previous classes that apply to this. 
So just like I spoke about last class, your standard operating procedures, your checklists, your timelines, your recipe manuals are very important. The last class we talked about hiring and training for food businesses. And this is one of those places, well, every part of your food business is gonna be one of the places that needs something like this. But um, this is one of the places where it can make or break your business. It can really make or break it. It can make you succeed or it can make you fail if you don't have it. Um, you have to have checklists and timelines as a habitual step, uh, operating procedure as a habitual step in the day for managers. And the reason is because there's so many things to do, you know, you, <laughs> you need a checklist for it. There's so many things to do. You have to, you know, make sure that the food is being produced. You have to make sure that you have enough on your shelves. You have to make sure that you have enough sales going on. So that warehouse manager is going to be a very key player, a really key player, especially because sometimes the warehouse manager has to hop in a truck and do a last minute delivery or something. As little things sometimes go wrong. So you want to make sure that you develop your um, your job descriptions in a really realistic way. So if you need help with that, again, that's why technical assistance is for. But when you develop a position, you can say, okay, I'm going to pay a warehouse manager. This job is going to be $60,000 full time. Um, and then, but this person needs to be there all the, you know, at the warehouse from this time to this time every day. These are the tasks. This is the, the supplies. This is what, um, you know, provide the truck, provide everything that they need. And all that costs money. So as we do that, we'll figure out what amount of money will it take to execute the business properly? Because you can always execute the business for less money. For um, You can always execute the business with less resources, but it's not going to be ideal. It's, it's definitely going to hurt something along the way sometimes, especially if you stretch people thin. You want to make sure that your employees, that your people have the resources that they need to do their jobs. So the checklists and the timelines and checking in with your employees regularly, make sure that you're hearing what's going on in the system. Make sure you're doing an employee review regularly and give them incentives to stay because this is a very stressful position. It's not stressful if they have, if they have everything that they need and there's a system, it can be a great job that makes people really happy because a lot of people like to work with their hands. A lot of people like to lift things. A lot of people like to organize things. Um, it can get really hectic and horrible if you don't have the systems in place because everyone's mad. You know, the customer doesn't get the order. The warehouse person doesn't have it in inventory and everything is just, everyone's frustrated and angry at each other. And that happens, you know, and I just, I'm here to give everyone real world situations. And that is a real world situation that I see all the time. I see it a lot. I see it multiple times a year in different places. And the simplest of things can help. And the simplest of things is creating a timeline and a checklist and do a regular check-in with your employee and give them incentives to stay, give them incentives for growth, show them that you care about them. It sounds so simple and it's crazy because it, it doesn't get done enough. It's, it's so simple. It almost makes me sad um, how I wish so many people took this more seriously. It would really change their business. So have your inventory list Make sure that you have that scheduled. Make sure it's happening because you're the business owner. Ultimately, you don't have to do everything. You definitely want to build a team and you want to be able to um, delegate a lot of tasks because your task has to be on growing your business and looking toward the future. And that's a lot of energy. So this type of stuff, you should be delegating, but you need to make sure it's happening. So 
that's why we're doing these workshops is so that you know what has to go on and what has to happen. And if you need help developing on how to train this, how to make it happen, how do I delegate this? That's why you schedule technical assistance because you have experienced people that can help you make that happen and make the right hiring choices. So we already spoke about this and I just included it in the last presentation, but I put it in this one. What is the importance of a timeline? It's hugely important. No matter if you create food in small batches or if you manage a whole production facility, it's all the same. Um, time, you have 24 hours in a day to produce thousands of things or produce a few. But the timeline is what's going to help you along the way to make sure that everything that you're doing is effective, efficient, and happens on time. Um, and it happens in a stress-free way, in a way that the employee already knows if they're ahead of schedule or if they're behind schedule, so they can adjust as they go. And it always allows the team to be able to have the 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 guidance that they need in order to know, okay, we're going to have to deliver this order. It has to get done by this time. So timelines are so helpful and they're a real roadmap for your employee to be able to time themselves and make sure that they're keeping themselves accountable of what their responsibilities are. Um, so that is for, that's what I wanted to talk about for the manufacturing class. Um, if you have any questions, please schedule technical assistance time. We can totally do this together. Uh, we can work on your business plan together. Uh, that's what I'm really hoping to do a lot of in December and November and January and February. So schedule your time with me. Uh, you have my email address. The next class is going to be about approaching your investors. Uh, it's going to be tomorrow at 6 p.m. And approaching your investors is going to be the last step. Once you write your business plan, you're going to approach investors. But there's a way to do it. And there are different strategies that you can use um, and different methods of raising your funds. So we're going to talk through it. I have uh, some really good books I've probably already recommended to you before, but we're going to talk about a few great lessons from those books. Uh, so I hope to see you next class. Um, because I don't know, some of you might need to approach some investors soon. So I hope to see you. And then that will be the last class of this series. Um, so please be here. I, I hope to see you here. I'm going to do a little raffle also. Um, so I hope to see you here. This is my contact information. You can follow us, tag us, um, Dreaming Out Loud, so D-O-L-D-C. Food Biz Mentor, or you also, a lot of you follow me personally at chef underscore Carolina Gomez. Um, I'm going to stick around. That was the end of this presentation. I hope to see you tomorrow night. Thank you for coming, especially in the evening. I, I think these evening hours are working out better for all of you. So if you do like that, uh, also, I'm going to ask, I'm going to send out a survey to find out because I'm trying to time these classes and convenient times so people can come. So thank you for being here. I'm going to stick around for any questions and um, I hope you have a great evening. <laughs>